8.6 Lesson 1, Integration by Tables and other integration techniques. Our objective for today is you'll be able to evaluate an indefinite integral using a table of integrals. An integration table is a collection of integration rules that have been uh, derived using the integration techniques that we've been learning about in Chapter 8. For example, some of these rules, such as rule number 75, would be derived using integration by parts. Other rules, such as rule number 24, uh, could be derived using partial fraction decomposition. But an integration table is a collection of integration rules. And you can see that the integration tables are organized by something having to do with the form of the integrand. For example, rule number 75, as we just mentioned, can be derived using integration by parts. So here's the integration by parts formula, and we'll see how that's applied to derive this integration rule for the indefinite integral of arc sine of u du. Uh, just to keep things uh, more organized, I will just go ahead and have the indefinite integral of arc sine of x dx, and after I find the antiderivative, we'll just make the x u to get what we have here. So, and the reason I want to do that is because I'm using integration by parts, so I will be saying let u be equal to arc sine of x. I don't want to say let u be equal to arc sine of u. So, let u be equal to arc sine of x, then dv would be the remaining part, which would be dx. To find v, you would integrate both sides of the equation dv is equal to dx, and you get v is equal to x. Again, no need to write the constant of integration here. We'll have one at the very end. And then to find u, to find du, we already have u. u is equal to arc sine of x. So to find the differential of u, you find the derivative of arc sine of x, which is here, and multiply by the differential of x. So now you would apply the integration by parts formula. The indefinite integral of u dv is equal to uv. So u times v minus the indefinite integral of v du. v is x and du is right here. So you have v du would be x times the uh, 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared dx. So that's what we have here. And then you can integrate the indefinite integral here by using a u substitution. Uh, I had u earlier, so I'm just going to use a different letter, but it's a u substitution. I'll let w be equal to the radicand 1 minus x squared then dw would be equal to negative 2x dx. I have x dx here, so I will isolate for x dx, and that would be negative 1 half dw. You can factor out the negative 1 half. Minus negative 1 half is plus 1 half, and then you will have the indefinite integral of 1 over the square root of w times dw. And then this is something that you can integrate by using a power rule for the power rule for integration. And once you do that and integrate, you can then go back to x by using your w substitution. Replace w with the square root of 1 minus x squared. And here is our integration rule for the indefinite integral of arc sine of x dx. And of course, like I said at the beginning, uh, we just wanted to use x and dx because we were using integration by parts and we didn't want to get confused with more than one u. But now that we have our rule, we will just replace x with u and we get rule number 75.
So why is this useful? It's useful if you want to do a problem that resembles the integrand that you have here for rule number 75, but perhaps it's not exactly the same. And here's what I mean. Let's take a look at an example for how you might apply rule number 75 from the integration table. The great thing about using integration tables is you don't have to do this work anymore, but you may still have to do a U substitution to be able to use a particular integration rule, such as rule number 75. So let's see an example for that. Suppose you have this integration problem, the indefinite integral of x times arc sine of x squared dx, and you want to know how to do that. What you might notice is that the argument of arc sine is x squared, and then arc sine of x squared is multiplied by x. And you might think to do a u substitution and then use rule number 75. The reason why you might think of using rule number 75 is because the problem that we're working on has arc sine of some argument, and rule number 75 has arc sine in it of the argument u. So we will let u be equal to x squared, and it works out because the differential of u is 2x dx, and we have x dx in our problem. So we will multiply both sides here by 1 half, and we get 1 half du is x dx. Then we will be able to change variables, and when we do that, we will have, using our u substitution, we're going to change variables. So x dx becomes 1 half du. We can factor out the 1 half. So x dx is 1 half du, and then we have arc sine of x squared, but we're letting u be x squared. So we have arc sine of u. And now you can see how rule number 75 will help us, because with rule number 75, we don't have to do anything else. We're just going to go ahead and say, okay, we're going to say the indefinite integral of arc sine of u du is u times arc sine of u plus the square root of 1 minus u squared plus c. So we're going to write 1 half times u times arc sine of u. u is x squared, so I have x squared times arc sine of x squared plus the square root of 1 minus u squared. 1 minus x squared squared is x to the fourth uh, plus c. And we're done. That's all you have to do there. We will take a look at another rule from one of the integration tables. And we will focus on rule number 24. How can you come up with the antiderivative that is shown in rule number 24? You can do partial fraction decomposition. So you can see that you begin with the indefinite integral of 1 over u squared minus a squared du. You can factor out a negative 1 from each term of the denominator, and then you can factor out negative 1 from the integrand. That would make it negative 1 times the indefinite integral of 1 over a squared minus u squared du. So how can we show that that inter indefinite integral has this antiderivative that is shown here in rule number 24. We can do partial fraction decomposition. So let's take a look at how we can do that. So we start with this particular form of the indefinite integral, as you see here in my work. And then if we look at the integrand, this is what we have. The denominator will factor as a difference of two squares. So the denominator factors as a plus u times a minus u. And we have this form of the partial fraction decomposition. Multiply both sides of this equation by the LCD to get the basic equation. Uh, assume the basic equation is already an identity and work backwards to find the values of a and b that would make it an identity. 
if you let u be equal to a, then you'll have a minus a, which is 0, and you'll be able to solve for b. So if you let u be equal to a, then a plus a is 2a. So you get 1 is equal to 2a times b. So b is equal to 1 over 2a. And then you can let u be equal to negative a, and that would allow you to solve for a in the basic equation, and you find that a is 1 over 2a. Substitute for a and b, and you're able to rewrite the integrand as you see here. Although it would be natural to proceed as I did here, if you do it that way, then you will get this form of the antiderivative, which is perfectly fine. It's just not what's presented here in Rule 24. So to get it exactly in the form that is presented in Rule 24, what you can do is you can factor out a negative 1 from the factor a minus u here. That would make this a negative 1. And then you will have, instead of a minus u, you will have u minus a. And then you can distribute the negative sign, which would make the first partial fraction negative and the second one positive. And doing it like that will give you what you have here on the yellow sticky note. So you'll have 1 over 2a times u minus a minus 1 over 2a times u plus a. And you can factor out 1 over 2a from each partial fraction because that is a constant with respect to u. And then you will have these two partial fractions for the integrand. You can use the log rule for integration. And then you can use a property of logarithms, the quotient property of logarithms, and that will get you exactly what you have for Rule 24. Suppose you have the problem that I just wrote on the screen, the indefinite integral of cosine theta over sine squared theta minus 5 d theta. Now we can actually use rule number 24 to help us do this problem. It might not be as obvious to you at first inspection, but one thing that might help you to see the applicability of rule number 24 is that you do have in the denominator the square of a function of theta, and although 5 is not a perfect square, you could write 5 as the square root of 5 squared. So the denominator has the form the square of a variable expression minus the square of a constant. So if we can just do a u substitution and make our problem like the indefinite integral from rule 24, we can apply it. And we can do that because if we let u be equal to sine of theta, then du will be cosine theta d theta, and that allows us to do our change of variables step for our problem, which would make the integrand just like what we have in Rule 24. So cosine theta d theta becomes du, so we'll have 1 over uh, and then in the denominator, we have sine squared theta, which would be u squared minus square root of 5 squared. So now that we have that, we can apply what we have for rule number 24. So rule number 24 says, if you have the indefinite integral of 1 over u squared minus a squared du, then the antiderivative will be, as you see here, given in the rule. So all I have to do now is write 1 over 2 times a. For us, a is square root of 5, so I have 2 times square root of 5 times the natural log of the absolute value of u minus a, u minus square root of 5 
over u plus a, u plus square root of 5, plus c. And of course, you want to go back to your original variable, which is theta in our problem. So you will replace u with sine of theta. So we have 1 over 2 times square root of 5, natural log of the absolute value of sine theta minus square root of 5 over sine theta plus square root of 5 plus c. And that's how you would do the problem that we have here. You would recognize that we used rule 24 in this problem along with a u substitution. This is our next example. Use a table of integrals with forms involving a plus bu to find the integral. And when you look at number 2 here, we have the indefinite integral of 2 over 3 times x squared times 2x minus 5 squared dx. One thing that you can do to begin the problem is to recognize that 2 and 3 are constants. So you can factor out, you can factor 2 thirds out of the integrand and have it be like this. And this makes it easier for you to look for an appropriate integration rule to apply from the integration table uh, with forms involving a plus bu. So now what do we need to look for? Well, we go to our appendix, the appendix of the textbook, and look at the integration tables and look at an integration table that has forms involving a plus bu because that's what we have here. Uh, we have something like a sum of uh, the u here signifies a variable expression. So you may actually want to perhaps write the problem like this. So instead of writing in the denominator x squared times 2x minus 5, maybe you want to write negative 5 plus 2x. So that's why we're looking at a table from our table of integrals, tables of integration, uh, integration tables. We're looking at the particular subset from the integration tables appendix for forms involving a plus bu. So we would expect that a would be negative 5 and b would be equal to 2. Uh, but let's see if we can find something that, that would have the form of the integrand that we have for number 2. So what we need to do is we need to look at our appendix, the appendix of our textbook and then we will look at one of the integration tables, specifically the one that has forms involving a plus bu. When you look at these rules, you will notice that the last few seem to resemble what we have in the denominator of our integrand. And when I say the last few, I'm talking about rules 10 through 13. So now we have to choose one of them that matches the denominator of our integrand. You'll see that our expression a plus bu, that quantity is raised to the second power. So we're going to choose either rule number 11 or rule number 13 because in those two rules the quantity a plus bu in the denominator is raised to the second power. And we're going to use rule number 13 because in rule number 11 that quantity is multiplied by u whereas in rule number 13 that quantity is multiplied by u squared. And we match a plus bu exactly because we have negative 5 plus 2 times x. So x would be like the u from the rule. So we should have x squared multiplying that square of the a plus bu factor. And we have that for rule number 13. So now we can apply rule number 13 to do our problem that we have for number 2. 
Although it's not really necessary to do a U substitution, you can if you'd like, because it doesn't, it's not really going to change anything in terms of the form of the integral. You'll just be replacing x with u. But if you want to, go ahead. It's fine. So you'll have 1 over, let u be equal to x, and du will be dx. So you'll have 1 over u squared times negative 5 plus 2u squared du. And you can see that matches the indefinite integral that we have for rule number 13 exactly. And you can see what the values we have for a and b are. a would be equal to negative 5, and b would be equal to positive 2. So we note that a is equal to negative 5, and b is equal to positive 2. And then we will just apply the integration rule that we have for rule number 13. So we still have the two-thirds that we factored out, so we have to multiply that by everything else. So according to the rule, we'll have negative 1 over a squared. a is negative 5. Negative 5 squared is 25 times a plus a is negative 5 plus 2 times b, 2 times 2 is 4, u over u times a plus b times u plus 2 times b over a times the natural log of the absolute value of u over a plus b u. plus our constant of integration. And if you want to go back to x, simply replace every u with x. And there is our answer for number 2, and we were able to do that by using rule number 13 from our integration tables. We now look at example 2 from our textbook find the indefinite integral of x times the square root of x to the fourth minus 9 dx. When you'd like to solve an integration problem by using an integration table, you have to first be familiar with what you have in your integration tables. And in our textbook in Appendix B, we have integration tables that are organized by the form of the integrand. So you look at the integrand that you have for the problem that you want to do, and you look at what the integration tables have that are similar to the form of the integrand that we have for the problem that we're working on. And looking at the integration tables, you'll see rules 26 onwards, and they have rules for integrands involving something like this, where you have the square root of the square of a variable quantity plus or minus the square of a constant. And we do have that here. Now you have an x here, but remember you're also going to do a u substitution to help you apply a particular rule. So it turns out that rule number 26 is going to work out nicely for us and we have that here, and we're going to see how we can use rule 26 along with the u substitution to help us find the indefinite integral. One thing that you'll notice right away is that because we have a minus sign here, and in rule 26 we have either plus or minus in the radicand, but because we have a minus, and you see of course that in the plus or minus, the minus is at the bottom, so you're going to adopt the signs that you have in the integration rule that are at the bottom. 
whenever you have plus or minus. And that's what you see here, here, and here. Other than that, what we have here is exactly rule 26. So your next step is to take the problem that we're given and you want to write it so that you have the square of a variable quantity. So if I want to write x to the fourth as the square of a variable quantity, my variable quantity must be x squared because x squared squared will give me x to the fourth minus a squared. 3 squared will give me 9. And now I can see what I need to do for my u substitution. I would like to make u be that variable expression that is being squared. So I let u be equal to x squared. But will it work out? Will I be able to do the problem? Let's see. Then the differential of u will be 2x dx. And I have x dx and that is why I'm able to do the problem using this particular integration rule. So I have uh, multiplied both sides of this equation by one-half to get one-half du is equal to x dx, and now I'm able to change variables. So x dx becomes one-half du, and I can factor out the one-half. And then I have the square root for my integrand. I have the square root of u squared minus 3 squared. And once I have that, I can apply the rule, the integration rule here, rule number 26. And I will just write, now this 1 half has to multiply everything that you see here because that is a factor that is multiplying the indefinite integral which fits the indefinite integral from the rule. So you'll have one-half times one-half times u minus the square root of u squared minus a squared. a for us is 3, so we have 3 squared minus a squared. a for us is 3 times the natural log of the absolute value of u plus the square root of u squared minus a squared. Put that in parentheses. That's multiplying by this factor of one-half. Put that in brackets and then you have plus c. Uh, actually, you can just multiply one-half times one-half and that would give you one-fourth. And then you have u minus the square root of u squared minus three squared is nine, minus three squared is nine, natural log, the absolute value of u plus the square root of u squared minus nine plus c. And finally, you can go back to x by rec remembering that u is equal to x squared. So I have 1 fourth times x squared minus x squared squared is x to the fourth minus 9 minus 9 times the natural log of the absolute value of x squared plus the square root of x squared squared, which is x to the fourth minus 9 plus c. Before moving on, I'd like to point out that for some reason I have a minus sign here, but I should not. Because if you look at the integration rule for formula 26, you have not u minus the square root of u squared minus a squared, but u times the square root of u squared minus a squared. I must have been looking somewhere else in the rule, so that's actually not u minus, but just u times the square root of u squared minus 3 squared. So my final answer would not be x squared minus, but x squared times 
the square root of x to the fourth minus 9 and continuing on. All multiplied by 1 fourth and then you have the constant of integration. Here's example 3 from our textbook. Find the indefinite integral of x divided by 1 plus e to the negative x squared dx. And if we want to look at the integration tables from Appendix B, one thing that you'll notice about the integrand is that in the denominator you have e raised to some power. So looking at the different integration tables from in, uh, Appendix B, you're going to look at the rules where the integrand has something involving e raised to some function of x. So you have, of the forms involving e to the u, which one are we going to look at? How do we come up with formula 84? Well, let's look at those forms. Here, you can immediately rule out everything else except 84, because none of the other rules have anything that looks like the integrand that we have for number 84. Uh, so, but number 84 looks very much like what we have for our problem. And of course, we do have to use a u substitution to make it work out. So here's the u substitution you should do. Because we have e raised to the negative x squared power, you're going to let u be equal to negative x squared. Then du will be negative 2x dx. And you can see that we have x dx, so we're able to change variables because now we can write this as negative 1 half times du is equal to x dx. And using our substitution, we can change variables. x dx becomes negative 1 half times du. And then in the denominator, we'll have 1 plus e to the negative x squared, or e to the u. And now our indefinite integral here matches what we have for rule number 84. So we can apply it, but don't forget, now you have a factor of negative 1 half that you have to take into account. So you have negative 1 half times everything from rule 84 plus the constant of integration. So rule 84 says you have u minus natural log of 1 plus e to the u plus c. Well, I already have the plus c. So you can write the plus c here. And now you can go back to x by replacing u with negative x squared. And there's my final answer. You do have the option of distributing negative 1 to each of these two terms in the brackets. And if you do that, then you'll have positive 1 half outside of the brackets, and then distribute negative 1 to each of the two terms inside the brackets to get positive x squared plus natural log of 1 plus e to the negative x squared plus c. Either of these are acceptable. In today's lesson, we saw that the integration rules from the integration tables in Appendix B are derived using the various integration techniques that we've learned in Chapter 8. And to use the integration rules, sometimes you have to possibly do some manipulation of the integrand. And in our problems that we did today, for most of them, we had to do a u substitution and then apply one of the integration rules.